Well, I'm Matt Fryer. Uh, I work for the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service, and I'm here with Tim Smith. Uh, he's owner of uh, Southern Soil Solutions. He's a cover crop seed dealer in our area, and uh, we're just going to talk about uh, a little bit about broadcast seeding uh, cover crops. Um, you know, because that's a lot of times that's a lot easier to do um, for somebody just getting started in cover crops and no-till system. It's to broadcast the seed, and and so when you when you look at seed, uh, aerodynamics are a little bit different. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but first, Tim, you know, how long have you been dealing seed and uh, mm -hmm. looking at looking at these different broadcast methods and seed combinations? Yeah, I've uh, actually been a seed dealer now for about uh, six years. It's my sixth year, uh, but I've been messing with cover crops since '98. I had to get, think about the date again, yeah. 1998. I managed a farm and we uh, integrated cover crops into the farm to try to bring soil health up and, uh, you know, kind of scavenge nutrients and help, you know, control a lot of the weeds that we were having sure. to deal with. So, uh, and we started out, most of everything we did was broadcast. So you can do broadcasting on cover crops, but there's some things you need to keep in mind when you, you know, drilling versus broadcast. Absolutely. And, and when you talk about broadcast too, you need to talk about, you know, am I going to do it with a buggy or airflow? Am I going to mix fertilizer with it? Am I going to do it with an airplane? Um, you know, there's, there's just little thing changes you have to make here and there. Am I going to cover it up sure. once I broadcast sure. it? Or am I, I going to have leaf drop to cover it? Or am I just going to let it stay on top of the ground? So uh, there's a lot to consider when you're trying to choose a cover crop seed to do what you want to do and the different circumstances that you're in so sure yeah. so is there any is there any species that you would recommend not broadcasting you know yeah. it's not an option uh, for yeah. seed size or, or whatever the sake yeah if you're going to broadcast and, and not, not incorporate and not incorporate then you're definitely going to want to take lupins out or austrian winter peas and the reason why is they're a big seed sure and a lot of times you can get there you can get just enough moisture there to swell that seed but it's not enough to germinate it so the failures i see on broadcast are mainly seeds like these uh, now when you get into some of your grass species a lot of your grass species work really well uh, we'll talk about the cossack oaks they're one of the ones that i push a lot because uh, they always rake real high as far as uh, nematode resistance uh, they do real good with competing with like pigweed and uh, uh, grow more lateral to the ground and create a lot of bioforge uh, I brought a couple of samples in here and uh, we're seeing more and more Cossack oats come into Arkansas and actually some folks are raising them in Arkansas and uh, but it's it's the, our weather's not really conducive here good enough to to really make a quality oat and uh, uh, I've got a sample here you can see both of these are Cossack oats and you can see this one's it looks like a black oat yeah. which a lot of people call Cossack oats black oats and it's really black seeded oats what it is and this is a Cossack oat here you can see it's not black at sure. all uh, that's just the difference in where it's being raised in the climate and also if you look at these seeds the one on the right here has been conditioned and that's a that's a must if you're going to, especially if you're going to broadcast seeds it's, it's a must that you have your Cossack oats uh, conditioned these right here are clean but they're not conditioned so they got real long uh, uh, beards on them mm -hmm. and I've noticed on the oats that are being harvested this year are real curly so they come off and they make a big curl well, that, that just messes up the aerodynamics on the seed. And what you're trying to do is keep the seed clean and smooth. And, you know, so the aerodynamics, it don't just go anywhere, you sure. know. So when and you say condition, you know, when you say these Cossack oats need to be conditioned, what exactly are you talking about? They need to have the beards taken off of okay. it. And, what, and there's a little, there's husk still on them too. So that lightens them up. Uh, in the warehouse here, I've got a uh, bulk bag it's got 2,000 pounds in it of the oats like this that are really dark and black. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a bolt bag right beside it where I brought some in to look at and, uh, and then re refused to take uh, any more. 
and uh, they're like this, and there's a thousand pounds in a bigger bulk bag. I know, I saw that. So there's a, you know, there's a wow. lot more difference in weight, and a lot of it's because you're buying husk than you're buying these uh, beards. So we'll, what we do, uh, anything that I run through here, I've got a debeerder. I'll run it through a debeerder. Then you have to run it through the cleaner to take everything off right. that you, the, the debeerder takes yeah. off. And uh, a debeerder is just a shaft with a bunch of blades on it that turns really fast. And as you run it through there, it cuts everything off. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'd recommend, especially if you're going to fly them on, that you condition them. Uh, another thing that I like about the Cossack Oats, it's a bigger, flatter seed, so it does really good when you're blending seeds together, helping hold some of these smaller seeds, like your rape seeds and your you know, and a lot of your brassicas yeah. and your clovers, helps hold them in suspension where they don't segregate to the bottom. Uh, so, you know, what I like to do a lot of times is maybe mix two grass species together and then maybe a, one or two lagoons and then a brassica. Okay. You know, whether it be a radish or a turnip or and it's just a lot of times preference um, another th when, when you look at say rapeseed or radish or you look at I've got some African cabbage here there's some kale there's purple top turnips purple top turnips are fairly popular in our state people like them because they make a real big leap and and they're a good scavenger uh, I tend to like the the radish a little better because uh, it, it will penetrate the ground. I know it grows out of the ground a lot, but it does penetrate the ground a lot. They both scavenge nutrients real well, so they're uh, collecting calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen. They'll take sure. any excess nitrogen that's left out there. Uh, radish seed will run about 30,000 seed per pound, whereas some of your purple tops and some of your kales and stuff, they'll run 140,000 seed per pound. So yeah. if you're planting a pound of radish and a pound of purple tops, you're going to get, you know, basically four times more seed per pound, so that's more plants. So sure. Germs are usually really high on your brassicas, your radishes and stuff. They'll run up in the, uh, I've seen them run up in the upper 90s, you know. So, uh, you know, usually you put them out, well, most of them are gonna come up. Uh, usually what I'll do is early, I'll go push people to the radish a lot because we can get a radish out early and get a lot of fall growth on yeah. it. It scavenges a lot of nutrients, it's put a big leaves out, and then a lot of times it won't winter, it'll die sure. out. So it naturally terminates. Uh, whereas a purple top would do better in the cooler climates, but the tubular on it's gonna be on top of the ground. It's like walking on hard cantaloupes right. in the field, you know? I've heard some farmers say bowling balls. Bowling balls, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. But uh, radish, I like to get the radish out, you know, by the 10th of October so I can get as much growth in them in the fall. You know, some years we have our early frost, they don't do well either, sure. late and that late. But if you can get them planted in August and September, they do really great and they, they're good scavengers. So when they die out, if you got them in a mix with cereal rye or another winter annual grass, mm -hmm. the gra those grasses and winter annuals are gonna do most of their growth in the fall yeah, and Yeah, and they're gonna pull a lot of the nutrients yeah. that those radishes have taken, yeah. you know. A lot of that stuff's you know, available to whatever crops out there. You know, the reason why I say get away from the, say, the peas, we got blue lupins here, we got winter peas, and then this is a, uh, a new pea that I'm bringing in that I've, uh, the Austrian winter pea is the most popular one. It's been around for about 60 years, my understanding. So it's kind of, it, it's not doing as good as I'd like to see our legumes do. Uh, it can die out, temperature gets down to 15 degrees, and we've gotten that for the last two years, and I've not seen the uh, spring growth out of the winter peas that I'd like to see, and I'm going to this, it's a, kind of a frosty forage pea out of Oregon, and it can handle, you know, sub-zero temperatures, so and it puts on a lot more, it's a forage pea, so it puts on a lot more forage, okay. so I'm looking forward to it, good nitrogen producer. Blue lupins, you know, the whole country used to be planting blue lupins back uh, before World War II. That's what a lot of cotton farmers used to make nitrogen. And then after World War II, we had the uh, invention of ammonia nitrate and just made it easier. So people put out sure. commercial fertilizer and they kind of fell out of the way, but they're still good uh, for cover. You need to plant them after the middle of September. You know, they're more of a cool season. Uh, they're good for forage, so they're good to put in, you know, mixes for grazing. Um, I brought uh, uh, 
some uh, Harry Vetch here. Harry Vetch does real good, you know, broadcast, sure. putting it out with an airplane or anything. It small just seated. does really good, small seed. Yeah. And it's a good nitrogen producer. Uh, I've got crimson clover here. We use crimson, uh, we use uh, bursine. I don't use much balanza just because it does have some hard seeds in it and they could germinate later and I'm always cautious about anything that becomes a weed. Sure. A uh, little bit of Lodino, not much, mainly in our wildlife mixes. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they, they all do really good in our climate. Uh, I've got some African cabbage here, Zabrasca, it's a small seed, kind of like your turnips. It doesn't put a tuber on, but it puts a real good taproot. So it's, it's a good one for putting in a, a broadcast mix. Bayou kale does good. I've got a new kale coming in this year called Sub-Zero, and it works really good on really cold temperatures, and a lot of your kales do a real good job of giving you ground cover, uh, cover and protecting against crusting during the spring. Good in the forage, you know, for grazing with cattle too. Sure. So, uh, I've got some safflower here. It's more of a warm season type plant. I like it because it's got a really, really deep root system. They say roots are grown four or five feet down in the ground. Oh, wow. A good scavenger fertilizer. They say the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil get excited around the roots of it, something that exudates out. Uh, I've got a pretty good selection of, of grass species, uh, millet. Uh, it's a small seeded one, does really good broadcast. A lot of folks think of millets because they broadcast them for duck hunting and stuff. Uh, barley, we use barley a lot. Barley seems to do better than say wheat or triticale or even uh, oats and cereal rye on your wetter heavy clay soils. The only drawback on barley is it does seem to host nematodes. Yeah. So it always comes in the bottom on nematodes. Yeah. Resistance. I agree. I like triticale. Triticale, I kind of consider it a premium cereal rye because you get a lot of the roots like you do on cereal rye, but you get the forage aspect and the stem strength like you do on wheat. Don't get as tall as cereal rye. A lot of people complain about cereal rye getting so tall. But triticale is a good one to go to, and uh, of course, your Cossack oats are good because they grow more lateral ground. Uh, the triticale I carry is a forage triticale, and so it's uh, uh, got a big wide leaf on it. Uh, Cossack oats have about a three-quarter inch wide leaf, so you, low stature, grows lateral to the ground, but it creates a lot of biomass. Uh, annual rye does pretty good on, on your heavier soils. Uh, we've played around with it a little bit on rice, but it can be a monster to terminate sometimes. Uh, if you're going to plant annual rye and plant rice, then I strongly recommend that you terminate, you know, two or three weeks before you plant your rice because a lot of times you think you've killed it and then all of a sudden you got to grow back mm -hmm. on it. And if your rice is coming up, it's, it's a tough one yep. to get rid of. That's so, a mess. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, a lot of what we plant in Arkansas is Elbon just because it's a, it's a, um, Good variety it does well in our area. It gets extremely tall, but it seems to have a real good winter tolerance. Um, so we we mainly plant Elbon. It's a noble foundation uh, variety. Right. They they bred it. If you take noble and spell it backwards, it's Elbon. Okay. So that's how they got their name. Um, and then I've got a forage cereal uh, rye that's. Uh, called Yankee that's a northern variety and I got it just because it's a little shorter stature but it's got a lot wider leaf than say uh, the Elbon does and uh, I think it would be a, a good one to look at as far as cover crops are concerned. So before we go into kind of mixes and talking about that mm -hmm. you know you said these oats need to be conditioned if mm -hmm. we're going to aerial broadcast them. What about just a uh, spinner broadcast? Do you think it, is it necessary to um, condition those oats before we I do. Spinner broadcast. Do. Okay. It's kind of, and that's the kind of the reason I, I've kind of found out from experience. Uh, the second year I was trying to play around with some cheaper oats that weren't conditioned, and and man, I just had people having trouble even drilling them because what they do is they'll bridge up in a drill, mm. and they won't fall through, and you have to put an attachment on there to actually stir the seed. And oats can be the a problem too, just regular like a bob oat or okay. something. 
but just condition them makes them do so much better. Now the, the both of these varieties are going uh, both of these samples here germ really good, but from a standpoint of blending application, you know, you definitely need to have them conditioned. Sure. Uh, that's just the key to remember on Cossack oats, is make sure they're conditioned. Okay. So, uh, everything yeah. else pretty well, you know. We just not had any trouble other than, you know, the peas on the Sure, on the they're, just because they're so large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Large seeded. You know, Tim and I had a really good conversation about cover crop seed selection. And um, I just like to go through some scenarios uh, for those of you that are interested in planting cover crops and maybe don't know where to start. and. Uh, we covered some really good information, but I like to just put things uh, visually where we can see them and um, just talk about some specific scenarios, um, maybe with just a monoculture, just a single species cover crop uh, for those that are starting out. And broadcasting method is, is a pretty easy establishment method uh, for, you know, first go around with cover crops. And so, you know, when, when I talk with producers about um, cover crop selection and um, I, I just like to ask them what's their goal what what are they after um, with with cover crops and um, and so this table here shows just kind of some strengths of grass or legume or brassica or broadleaf cover crops <clears throat> and so just because these don't have check marks beside them here in the legume and brassicas for weed control and infiltration and organic matter doesn't mean that they don't help with that. I just put these check marks here for um, demonstration of the strengths of, of these species where they really shine. And so, you know, I ask producers, what's their goal? Is it weed control, increased infiltration, um, increased organic matter? Um, or do they want some nitrogen credits? Or they just want to look to uh, improve erosion control and, and, and reduce that or reduce um, diseases. You know, we, we talk about crop rotation and we all know that that's beneficial. And so we need to keep that in mind when we plant cover crops. We do not want to plant a solid grass cover crop in front of a grass cash crop or a legume in front of a legume. We want, we want some diversity there. <clears throat> And so grasses are really good for weed control infiltration because they have lasting residue, um, higher carbon to nitrogen uh, ratios, deep root system, fibrous root systems that really help with water infiltration. Uh, legumes uh, really add nitrogen and they fix nitrogen in the soil. And brassicas are typically increased diversity, plant diversity, because we don't typically grow brassicas for a cash crop in Arkansas. And so, and so when we when we talk about seeding rates and planting dates, I wanted to show this fact sheet that we have. Um, it has cover crop species, has our winter grasses here in this first section, legumes, and then so I just wanted to point out these ideal planting windows. Um, you'll notice that our cereals, our winter grasses have later planting windows. Uh, and then when you get down to legumes and especially broad leaves uh, like our uh, brassicas here, planting dates pretty important. So when we're starting out um, just for a single species in front of cotton, you know, I, I would say let's plant some grasses here to, to improve that diversity and not plant a broad leaf or a legume in front of a broad leaf cash crop. <clears throat> now we can we can mix those in, no doubt, but let, we're just going for a single species right now. We're going to talk about cover uh, planting dates. And so brassicas do most of their growth in the fall and typically winter kill. And so if you're getting past mid-October, um, just getting around and planting the cover crop, regardless of the situation, I will leave brassicas out of the equation because 
You're not going to get any growth out of them. Um, they're going to typically winter kill. Now grasses, on the other hand, if you're planting late, they're a great option. Um, when you're talking about planting depth, um, you know, if you're if you're mixing things, we want to a, a depth that, that's re, uh, referencing all all of the cover crops in the mix. Um, but but for broadcast scenario, which we're talking about here, <coughs> um, you know, we want to try to stick to small seeded cover crops so that they'll germinate well. Um, and if you're planting early, uh, if, if you're on an earlier planting date, you know, we've got a range of seeding rates here. So if you're on the earlier side, we can definitely stick with this lower seeding rate. Um, but if you're getting late, you're getting into November, I would stick with this higher 60 pound seeding rate for cereals. Uh, and that's the same for legumes and, um, and broad leaves. And so, you know, we, planting dates important, you know, producers ask, well, what do you recommend? What seeding rate? Um, what, what cover crop do you recommend? And there's no cookie cutter answer. I've got to put all of these scenarios uh, into the equation. Uh, planting date, the time of the year we're, we're planting, um, what's our cash crop, and what are the goals that you're looking to achieve with the cover crop. And so um, I just wanted to cover those things. Um, and I hope this is beneficial. And, uh, and, the, and the, we've got another video where we're going to talk about um, cover crop um, mixes. And so look for that one uh, where we talk about uh, different mixes to throw in in front of a, a cash crop. So here's my contact information. If you've got any questions, um, <clears throat> if you like that fact sheet I just showed with the planning, uh, planning dates and rates, um, you can just Google 2019 cover crop establishment uh, in Arkansas, or just give me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. And we've also got producers that I work with regularly that, that have been doing cover crops for many years. And so I can connect you with them. They've got more large scale, uh, practical experience uh, of what not to do. Uh, so that hopefully that'll, that'll help you avoid some, uh, help you av avoid some um, potential problems. So I hope this is beneficial and uh, thanks for watching.